Thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to be here. What a wonderful spot this is, isn't it? And couldn't be a better place to talk about the sort of uh, topic that I uh, had the opportunity to talk about this afternoon. Um, first of all, I, an admission. Um, I'm an amateur. I'm an amateur neurologist. I'm an amateur educationist. I'm an amateur uh, on, a, on a spiritual journey, um, a lifetime journey in all these areas. Um, and I've already said to Terry that if I, if I show my ignorance uh, publicly, I give him every permission to correct me in terms of my understandings of neurology. I want to talk to you about two journeys. Uh, one is a relatively new scientific journey, and one is, uh, so far in my life, a lifetime journey. And they have uh, crossed over in, in some interesting ways in recent times. Neurology obviously is a, a, an old science, but with very new findings. And neuroimaging has enabled us to understand a lot more about the way that the brain works. Spirituality, if I asked each of you to define it, you would all have a different definition. And some of your definitions would be very lacking in definition, and some of them would be very structured in their definition. As an educator, who's been teaching for 30 years, geography by the way, uh, nothing to do with neurology or theology, uh, I find it absolutely inspiring to read of the new understandings that we are now receiving from neurological research about the way the brain learns, the way that we learn. Spirituality, I guess if we could put it in a nice simple definition, is a journey. It's a journey about finding meaning in life. And neurology has some interesting things to inform us about that journey. And that journey has some interesting ways of informing the way that maybe we think about education. Let me first of all try to explain in my very novice and amateurish way the way in which neurology and uh, spirituality have been coming together in recent years. Uh, Dr. Ramachandran, who some of you will have seen giving TED Talks, uh, has been doing research into uh, the neurology of spirituality, trying to find a thing called the God module in our brains. Uh, and he found the connection between uh, temp uh, temp uh, temporal epilepsy, temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, and hyper-religiosity. So there's an interesting connection. There are some people who have brain disorders that give them a particular experience of spirituality. Now, of course, he's not claiming that everybody who has a spiritual or a religious experience uh, has temporal epilepsy, but he has found that there is that connection. Michael Persinger, another neuroscientist, created what's called the God Helmet, um, a whole baggage of uh, electrons placed around the person's head with electrical impulses passed through the temporal lobe to see what happens. And in most of the cases, these people who had this experience talked about feeling calm, at peace, feeling one with the world. Something happened when electrical currents were uh, generated into the temporal lobe. Now, most of the research that's been going on by people interested in what are called RSMEs, religious, spiritual, and mystical experiences, while being brain scanned, have found a very simple uh, probably simplistic in the way that I'm describing it phenomenon and that is that when people are for example meditating or praying the limbic system quietens down and the prefrontal cortex becomes more active and so the 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 old age-old notion that meditation uh, quietens the mind and makes a clear thinker is now neurologically and physiologically being demonstrated to be true I think one of the, the neurological researchers in this area that has brought the most insight and the most balance in this particular field is Andrew Newberg. And with his various teams of, of researchers and the, the interesting uh, research papers and books that he's written, he is, has been able to demonstrate that in the uh, parietal lobe, uh, when people are meditating, uh, that that area quietens, an area of the parietal lobe quietens down. Now that area of the parietal lobe is what gives us a sense of space, what gives us a sense of, of that, that something is distant from us or close to us. And de thereby demonstrating 
that in the um, act of meditating, uh, when people say they, they have a sense of oneness with the world, that's exactly what happens because the barriers, the, between, the space barriers, disappear. Now, in contrast to all of that, some uh, researchers also uh, scanned uh, people in a state of ecstasy, religious ecstasy, glossolalia, and they found the opposite to be true, that people experiencing glossolalia, their limbic systems became much more active and their prefrontal cortex became less active. Now, what, what does this tell us? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't prove God. It doesn't prove that we have a soul, although, interestingly, in calling this search, the search for the God spot or the God module, there's almost been an ancient search for if the soul's not here, then maybe it's somewhere in here. But they actually haven't found it. What I think it tells us is that when <coughs> people over the ages have described RSMEs, religious, spiritual, mystical experiences, they haven't been making it up. It's actually physio physiologically and neurologically now evident in the research that these people have been doing. That's just a quick thumbnail sketch to give you an indication of the way in which neurology and spirituality are being brought together at this time. My interest as an educator, and even more so my interest as somebody who's been on my own spiritual journey over a lifetime in a very faltering, uh, mistake-ridden way, is a little more general than that. And as an educator, I've been reading a lot about neurological capacities and how that might inform the, our approach to education and in, my term, in, in terms personally, uh, my own spiritual journey. And I'd just like to share uh, that with you uh, for a few moments this afternoon. Essentially, my spiritual journey, and I assume that it's probably the same for most people, because I do believe that spiritu spirituality is innate. It's part of who we are, and I think the research is demonstrating that that's true. Spirituality is about asking questions. And interestingly today, we've already had a number of those questions asked. I think of it as six questions. Who am I? Whose am I? Or, or what is mine? What is meaningful to me? What difference do I make? Am I a good person? And what is the purpose of my life? And in reading about neurology, I found six neurological capacities that kind of explain why we need to ask those questions. So let's take the first one. Who am I? The reptilian brain, as was described this morning, senses, through the senses, tells us about the world around us. And the information that the reptilian brain receives operates and moderates the automatic functions, our breathing, our heart rate, our temperature, and so forth. And it's the representations that, those, those, that information tells us that distinguishes our identity, that I am not a tree, I am not another person, I am me. And so there's at, 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 at the fundamental base of the, the, the first part of the brain that developed is this, this, this reason that we have a need to identify and know who I am. Now, the, the natural, as we also heard this morning, the natural orientation of that information is self-preservation. And so we are, in a sense, hardwired to be selfish. Therefore, if that knowledge is going to inform a spiritual journey that is about transforming us from being selfish people to being compassionate and thoughtful and considerate people who make a difference in the world, somehow we need to find a gateway that helps to make that transformation. And I want to suggest to you that a very, very simple way of doing that is through community service. It doesn't sound very profound, does it? But in being actively involved in helping others, we are on the journey of transforming what is a naturally selfish, self-protection, protective uh, dynamic to something that is thinking first about others rather than ourselves. Now, as an, as an educator and as an, an educational administrator for many years, I am very proud of the fact that I have given so many people the opportunity to go and do community service. Then I stop and think, how much have I actually done? Not much, to be honest. 
So the next step for me on my spiritual journey, in my transformation from being a selfish person to being a selfless person, is to get out there and do a bit of it myself. The second question, who am I, or whose am I, or what is mine, is all about possessiveness and the fight or flight syndrome, which I'm sure you're all aware of and which is driven from the limbic brain, is all about being secure. Now, that therefore means that we become, we are possessive, we are, we are neurologically orientated to being possessive. If we want to make the spiritual journey, therefore, from being selfish people to being generous people, we need to find ways of finding new patterns. The word this morning that we heard patterns we our brain is, is programmed for patterns and in this world without walls we need to break down some of those patterns and form new ones i don't believe that we break down patterns that have no patterns that makes us nothing but we need to break down certain patterns and create new ones and so another way of creating new patterns that create generosity is by being involved in charity now, again, I have, I'm embarrassed to say that it's only in the last three or four years, probably, in my life, as somebody who's now getting ancient, where I have gone through the discipline, and I would call it a spiritual discipline, a spiritual discipline that I lack, of giving a certain percentage of my income to the charity. That is shocking to get to 57 and only have developed that discipline at this age. But that's another way through education and on our own personal journeys that we can develop what I call, as I say, spiritual disciplines to become less selfish people and more generous people. The third question is escaping me, and which is why I brought this. How do I make it? Thank you. No, that's, the, that's a bit further on. I, I, I was told that I wasn't allowed to use notes. So I thought I would, if I had a, a blank spot, I would have this very clever ruse of my phone ringing and going, uh, yeah, look, sorry, I'm, I'm busy right at the moment. I can't talk, but the third one down there. Yeah, what is meaningful? <laughs> so the question, what is meaningful? The part, the, we now move from the reptilian brain and the limbic brain into the prefrontal cortex, which is called the orchestra of the brain. It's where we receive all sorts of information and we coordinate it and we orchestrate it so that we can make meaning out of what we're doing and, and achieve things. So in the prefrontal cortex, we have this ability to order information and it's just simply the cognitive capacity to think logically. Now there's an interesting endpoint of logic. If you take logic to its endpoint, it's actually a cause of conflict. Why do I say that? If you get two or three people and they're looking at the same problem and they think through it logically, they may come to the same conclusions, but it's very likely they'll come to different conclusions. And so logic in its nature is something that divides people rather than naturally brings people together. So if we're on a spiritual journey and we want to transform that neurological capacity into something that is for the betterment of others and to make our lives more meaningful, we have to find another end point and that's why it's so important to be mixing in groups of people that are different to ourselves, that have different religious beliefs, that have different cultures, that have different ways of thinking. My doctoral research was done in two villages in Western Thailand, with a Buddhist village and a uh, Catholic village. And I, for two years, worked with them on their stories about interactions between the two villages as they worked together on various joint projects. The most powerful message that came out of that whole process was it wasn't what they said to each other that changed their lives, it was what they worked on together. And through working together on those joint development projects, like putting in water pipes and so forth, that they learnt about each other. I had a similar uh, an experience recently with my wife, and this is a slight irony on my recent interest in neurology, had a, was diagnosed with a brain tumour two years ago. Fortunately she's here, she's beautiful, she's doing great. The tumour was removed. She's Thai, and her family all gathered, and we were in the hospital together. We, our religious tradition is Christianity. So the family came, they're all Buddhist. They brought an image of, of the Buddha, and they brought an image of Christ, and they put it in the room. My initial reaction was, we can't have it both in here. This isn't gonna work. They're gonna have a fight. Actually, it was a beautiful expression of how 
despite our different perspectives. When we have a common goal and a common perspective, those barriers, those walls break down and our true spirituality is given expression. The fourth question was, what difference do I make? And the neurological capacity that drives that is imagination. We have this amazing ability to think of things that aren't, that could be. We have the ability to, to come up with ideas, new inventions, uh, plays, as we've just heard, paintings. We have this amazing imaginative dimension that comes from our prefrontal cortex. Again, the natural orientation of that, if you watch TV these days, is fame and glory. Everybody wants to be a star. Another natural orientation of that is, is pleasure. We want to use our creative abilities to enjoy our lives. But if we're on the spiritual journey, that's about transforming our natural orientations towards something that is better for others and better for ourselves, then how do we, we need to change that somehow. In the educational process, we do that by involving students in the creative arts. A personal experience, again, that demonstrates my lack of spirituality, but I'm hoping one day that this will come right. I, I, my, my creative expression is music, and I love writing songs. And I actually, I'm from New Zealand, along with Anthony. We shared some, uh, over lunch, um, we come from the same country, wonderful. And I won a national songwriting competition when I was much younger than I am now. And I suddenly thought, I've got a formula. I've got a formula for success. I can write songs like this all my life, and people will pay money for them, and I'll become famous and rich. And I tried to write that song over and over again and completely failed. The reason was because my motivation was wrong. And it was only when I started writing songs to tell my wife how much I love her, and I started writing songs to help other people express their spirituality, that suddenly I started writing good songs again. And so this is a, another example of this, this journey that we're on. We are, we are trying to uh, use what we know about the way our natural tendencies neurologically to create this transformation. The fifth question, am I a good person? I don't know about you, but that's the one that's bugged me all my life because I never quite feel as though I am. I always feel my mistakes. I always live my mistakes again and repeat them. And I think at 57, I should be better than this. I should have got on top of this by now. And yet here I am doing it all over again. The neurological capacity that gives us the desire to be good people. My phone's ringing again. <laughs> Hello. No, sorry, not available. Um, we have what's called, what neurologists call attention. We have this ability to attend in our minds to things with great concentration. And the most obvious example of that spiritually is meditation when we have the ability just to focus on one thing and really zone in on it. Now reflection can become a bit, if we're not careful, can become a bit navel-gazing. The focus of that process can become ourselves. And when we start to focus on ourselves, that's when we really start to see all our warts and all that. And so this journey that we're on, this transformative journey, Somehow we need to change the focus of that reflection from ourselves to the world around us, to the people around us, so that we see what we can contribute rather than the constraints that we, in our limitations, create. Damn phone, I wish it would ring all the time. I'll have to do so. You can take that off me next time, honey, will you? Another example of why this journey is important. As a, as a head teacher, headmaster, principal, whatever you want to call it, for a lot, lot of years, I, I think I, I recall one instance where I really feel I failed. And that was with a, a, a teacher who, uh, for a whole lot of reasons that I won't go into, uh, we were having problems with. And I had a meeting with this teacher, and I just told her, point blank, you can't stay on, you've got to go, and this is unacceptable. But I did it in a really cruel way. And ever since, I, ever since I, that happened, I've regretted it. And I know that one day I have to go to that person and I have to ask for forgiveness. And until I do, I will, my spiritual growth will be stunted. And that's an example, I think, of where if we don't think about 
others. We don't think about them, about their feelings, about their family needs, and we only think about what's good for me. It puts us in a very difficult position in terms of our spiritual growth. And finally, question, what's the purpose of my life? And the neurological capacity that makes us want to ask, ask that question is called projection. Neurologists call it projection. And it's the ability, we've already heard it today as well, that ability that we have as human beings to be in three time zones all at once, past, present, future. And because we are able to project the present into the future, we're able to plan, we're able to look at options, we have the opportunity to make decisions. So is our planning, is our projecting, is our thinking all about us, about my ambitions, about what I want, or is it about what I can do, the talents that I can use to be able to make life, uh, the world a better place for other people as well as a more enriching place for me. If there's one thing I've learnt in my many years as a teacher and as a school administrator, it's the power of patience. And I think the power of patience comes from putting aside what one wants for oneself and putting in place what's best for others and being willing to keep going with determination until you achieve it, come what may. I leave you with uh, the words of uh, a poet in the last century, Maria Rayner Rilke, live the questions. Thank you for listening.